Hello everyone, my name is Ed Romney. I'm an architect in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and I am going to do a presentation on telling stories in architecture. Uh, I really enjoy being an architect. I've been practicing uh, on my own for about 18 years. I've been licensed since 1995. Uh, I'm also LEED accredited, and uh, here we go. I'm going to break the presentation down into three, three phases or three chapters. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what inspired me to be an architect in the first place. Second, I'm going to talk about some of my work when I was a student, uh, striving for a master's degree in architecture. And the third chapter is me practicing architecture and some of my built work and uh, how it how it becomes good stories uh, of the people uh, for whom I build. Uh, first, let's start out with inspiration. Uh, one of the, the most inspiring pieces of architecture uh, I came across early in my career, or early in my life, uh, was the Falling Water House in um, Pennsylvania, just east, southeast of Pittsburgh. It's, uh, it's an amazing place the more common view of falling water is shown here. A uh, beautifully integrated house with the waterfall. The stones that form those enormous piers were harvested locally. Um, so when they quarried the stone, the stones of the house would match the stone outcroppings that allowed the waterfall to exist. The concrete balconies or the concrete cantilevers um, really, really made the building come alive uh, and, and connect the building in many ways to the waterfall without actually touching it. Uh, later, later in my studies, um, the Pantheon, the Dome of the Pantheon in Rome, it's about 2,000 years old, is one of the oldest concrete structures in the world. And what fascinates me is that there's this decorative pattern uh, embossed into the surface of the concrete. And it's not purely decoration, and I'll explain why. If all of those coffers, as they're referred to, were filled in with concrete, the dome would be too heavy to stand. So if the, if the dome was all smooth, like it is towards the top, uh, there would be too much concrete, there would be too much weight, and the dome would have collapsed by now. What the engineers realized was that lightening the dome was essential to having the dome stand for the long term. By removing concrete, they were able to lighten the dome. But by removing concrete, they also created this beautiful decorative pattern in the concrete. So the decoration and the engineering are actually one idea, not two separate ideas. Whenever I travel, uh, I love to sketch. I find that sketching the buildings that I'm looking at helps me remember them. I remember the, the type of day it was. I remember the people who I spoke to. And it really becomes much more of an experience uh, of a place when I draw and sketch than simply if I take photographs. Another, um, another critical place in my, I'll call it me being inspired to be an architect, uh, is the Citadel at Machu Picchu. Basically taking a mountaintop and sculpting it into a beautiful place to live. Machu Picchu has so many features. I'm only going to talk about a couple here, but you can see on this slide uh, there's terracing off to the left in the slide. That terracing really was to allow for horizontal surfaces to plant crops, planting crops, making food. The big open plaza to the right is not just a big grass field where activities could be held, but it's actually a multi-layered, well-engineered structure to collect water and channel the water in and around the complex so that that water could be used for drinking, 
Uh, it could be filtered through fountains, as you see here. It could be used to irrigate the farmlands, the terraces, etc. So the, the engineering of the entire place becomes something that helps people live there comfortably. Really, really quite, quite amazing uh, that they were able to integrate so many incredible necessities uh, into, a, into a beautiful place. Uh, some of you may know this place. This is Stonehenge. Um, well, it's actually a drawing of Stonehenge. And what it shows is some of the solar and lunar alignments. So structures on the face of the Earth actually relate to the sun, the setting of the sun, the rising of the sun, the moon, the setting of the moon, the rising of the moon. And what it becomes is this enormous calendar to help the people relate to the earth and the moon at different times of the year. In some cases, it informed them when to plant crops. In some cases, it informed them when to harvest their crops. Uh, so this kind of enormous calendar uh, was really critical to helping the people live their lives uh, on a daily basis. And this next slide is a photograph of Stonehenge uh, at sunrise on the equinox. And you can see how the structure of the stone relates beautifully uh, to the rising of the sun. I'd like to move now into uh, my own education. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in architectural design. I have a master's degree uh, in architectural design. And the reason that I went back for a master's degree was several, several fold. Number one, um, the rules changed and my bachelor's degree, which was a four-year bachelor's degree, did not qualify me uh, to take my licensing exam. But more importantly, I wanted a little more time to explore design, architectural design, and I wanted to be in an environment where there were a lot of other people exploring design, and the instructors really pushed the students very hard uh, to... Uh, to look at what they were really standing for, to look at what they really believed, uh, and see if they can find ways to make that uh, into beautiful works of architecture. The first student project uh, that I want to talk about was a design competition in Istanbul, Turkey. What you're seeing here is an aerial view of a portion of Istanbul. To the lower left, the big structure is the Blue Mosque of Istanbul. To the upper right, that larger structure is the Hagia Sophia. The Blue Mosque, obviously made as a mosque, made for uh, Muslim worship, for Islam. The Hagia Sophia was originally designed as a Christian church. And if you look at the floor plans of both, and I'm not going to get too much into the detail, but if you look at the floor plans of both, you can really see a difference in the way that the spaces are laid out um, for a Muslim worship versus a Christian uh, church or ceremony. The space for the competition or the site for the competition was this plaza between the church and the mosque, these two squares that connected. And the program for the project was an anthropology museum. I thought it was very interesting that an anthropology museum would be used to connect a church with a mosque, but it made sense in a lot of ways as well. An anthropology museum is about people, it's about the human being, it's about the human body, it's in a lot of ways about the human as an animal, whereas the church and the mosque are the spiritual components uh, of human life. During the competition, um, what I realized was that the, the museum itself, uh, discussing the physical aspects of being human, should defer to the church and the mosque, which describe or discuss the spiritual aspects of being human. So I recessed the, the museum down into the ground, 
and the roof itself, you could see it there in the middle, uh, became an all-glass roof. So when um, the museum was illuminated at night, it created this lit pathway connecting the Blue Mosque with the Hagia Sophia. Why is this important? Why is this a critical idea? Well, in thinking about the Anthropology Museum, it occurred to me that the commonality between people of Christian faith and people of Muslim faith is that they're all human. And this Anthropology Museum is about that humanity. So by creating a building which was effectively a path of light, a lighted pathway between the two structures, I was able to take the two structures, combine them into a single composition, and then as I looked at that idea of this path of light, it occurred to me that it exists on many levels. Number one, it's a lighted pathway, so you can walk back and forth on a lighted pathway between the two structures, but if you think about it in a spiritual sense, harmony between people of one faith and another will come through an understanding of their common humanity. The path of light then became a metaphor for a higher level of spiritual thinking, light becoming more of a spiritual illumination. So this idea of the path of light became the story uh, of people being able to live in harmony even though they have these different spiritual beliefs. Um, and that's why I titled the project The Path of Light, um, because I really truly believe that for people to live uh, in harmony together on the planet, um, we've got to be accepting of each other's differences and embrace each other's similarities. In the presentation, uh, these are some very basic pencil renderings of the interior of the space. Uh, in the drawing on the right, you can see people way up top uh, on the glass surface. Um, as you go further and further down into the space, uh, it gets darker and darker. The spaces were actually lay laid out in a double helix uh, wrapping around each other, uh, kind of as an allusion to the DNA molecule. There are lots of subtle um, uh, symbolisms and symmetries and whatnot uh, that I used to kind of further the metaphor of this path of light, this path of illumination. The next project, uh, again these are my projects during uh, my education, during my master's degree, the next project was a Roman Catholic uh, cathedral, baptistry, and funeral chapel. Um, in, in the floor plan, if north is up on the drawing, towards the top of the drawing, uh, the baptistry and bell tower are to the east, right? Sunrise, birth. Uh, the church itself is positioned in the center as the life of the congregation. And then all the way to the left or to the west uh, is an open-air funeral chapel. Birth, life, death. Uh, if you look at the funeral chapel, for example, for an example, uh, you see a square patterned floor uh, surrounded by a circle. Now that circle is depicted by uh, the stations of the cross, right? The 13 places uh, along the pathway to crucifixion for Jesus. And in Christian symbolism, the cross, or excuse me, the square inscribed in the circle uh, is actually the symbol for the transition between earth and heaven. So the funeral chapel, being a square inscribed in the cross, um, reinforces. In this next image, uh, you're looking at the front entrance of the cathedral. 
there's one thing that I want you to notice. If you look at the stairs going up into the cathedral and the two areas to either side of the stairs, you'll notice that there's a ramp um, to either side. It's actually one long ramp. And what that is, is a ramp that integrates with the stair. And if you look at the landings along the stair, you'll notice that those are also the landings of the ramp. What this is, is a story about equality. It's a story about people uh, who need a ramp, somebody in a wheelchair, for example, being able to use the stairs along with somebody who is ambulatory and can just walk straight up the stairs. Those landings provide points for somebody, again, in a wheelchair, for example, to experience what it's like to be on the stairs uh, and enter up into uh, the church itself. The next slide is looking down into the cathedral. You're looking towards the altar and the pulpit. You may notice that the altar, the larger of those two uh, table areas, is pushed off to the side. In traditional cathedrals, the altar is actually on that central axis. In this case, the central axis is free of the altar, or the altar is pushed to the side. Now, what does that say? If you look just past the altar in the pulpit, you'll see a small square with a circle and a cross inscribed in it. Um, that is the point where people receive communion during the Roman Catholic service. That is the point that I believe is the most important point of the service, the communion, where everybody comes together, not the altar. The important part of the church is not the church hierarchy, the important part of the church is the people, and this arrangement of the altar and the pulpit flanking the central axis and the place where people walk to receive communion uh, talks about how people are the important part of the service. What you're looking at here is a model, uh, a model of the church, and yes, working with all those toothpicks was a whole lot of fun. Uh, and a lot of people thought I was tremendously crazy for attempting to model the whole church. But, uh, you know, in retrospect, you do things in your life and you think, that was kind of nuts at the time, but I'm glad I did it. Anyway, what you're looking at here is the front entrance of the church. You're seeing the stairs in the foreground. Uh, if you look down to the right, you'll see the ramp uh, and how the ramp integrates with the stair landings. The reason that I'm showing you this image is to show you the proportions of the church, right? The height of the columns, the vertical portion of the, that structure uh, is inscribed in a square. The roof structure is inscribed in an equilateral triangle. In Christian symbolism, the square is the symbol for the earthly dwelling, and the equilateral triangle is the symbol for the heavenly dwelling. So setting the equilateral triangle on top of the square puts the earth and the heavens in relative position next to one another, and that guides the proportions of the building section uh, through the cathedral. This is the kind of stuff that I love. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that it really makes the structure a story. It makes the structure meaningful by introducing signs and symbols that relate specifically to the use, in this case, a Roman Catholic church, uh, relates specifically to the use of the church. I, in this photograph, I would like to address one other issue. The circle with the cross inscribed in it. Right, The equal arm cross is typically seen as a Greek Orthodox cross, not a Roman Catholic cross. However, there are um, medallions were found from the early days of Christianity, and the, the Catholics or the, the Christians would wear these medallions uh, to identify one another. The medallion was a circle with a cross inscribed, an equal arm cross inscribed in it. 
And what I started to, to believe and what I started to, to think was that the circle with an equal arm cross inscribed in it is actually very Roman Christian or Roman Catholic. So I brought that symbol back uh, to this Roman Catholic cathedral um, as a way of acknowledging what the Christians went through in the early Roman days um, in order to survive, in order to thrive. One of my favorite photographs of any of my work, uh, this is the same model that you were just looking at. You're actually looking into the model. And we had this one great day. I took the model out. I took the model out into a field and we took photographs. And when I say we, a couple of the other students were with me uh, to keep company. And we took photographs every half an hour. So we set a timer. And then every half an hour, we would take another photograph to see what the sun looked like in the space. This is the photograph at sunset on the equinox. And uh, that the cross uh, framing the sun and the sun inside the cross like that. Um, I've, I've, I've always been very excited and very proud of that image. Um, it was it was a great day and it was a great ending to the day that the alignment functioned properly and uh, we were able to uh, to capture that image on film. Very very exciting. Uh, what I would like to do now is to move into my practice. This is me graduating from school and starting to work as an architect. Uh, what you're seeing in this photograph. Uh, is a cast in place concrete stair of a parking garage. Um, very, very interesting learning to work well with cast in place concrete. Uh, an absolute blast. Um, frustrating at times, um, but at the same time, um, a very exciting process. So here we go. Uh, this is practice. Um, one of the things that comes across very quickly when you start practicing as an architect is the need for and the use of codes, zoning codes, zoning ordinances of different townships, different cities, different counties, and building codes. Uh, along with building codes, you have existing building codes, you have uh, accessibility or handicapped accessibility codes, you have mechanical codes for heating and cooling. You have energy conservation codes to restrict or limit the amount of energy that buildings consume. You have plumbing codes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, many, many people look at the codes and think that they're restrictions. Um, I kind of look at them as the game rules. Uh, you don't play a football game without knowing the rules of the game. And in this case, you don't build a building without knowing the rules of the game. How do you build a safe building? Um, I think it's important to know the codes so well that you can interpret them, that you can be creative with them, that you can use them to create buildings um, not commonly built, I guess is probably the best way to say it, that you can innovate with your design work. Uh, one of my first projects uh, on my own um, is this single family house in a neighborhood. You're seeing a house to the left, you're seeing a house off to the right, but in the middle there, you're seeing a person in white pants standing next to the base of a beech tree. That tree was in the exact location where a house in this neighborhood normally would have been built. The owner said, we're not taking down the tree. We're working around the tree. And the husband made this incredible comment. He said, I'll never forget this. Carl was such a cool guy. Um, he, says, he says, I want to wake up with the birds in the morning. We've got a tree right there. I want to wake up with the birds in the morning. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, I didn't have a sense of what that could mean in the design of a building. And so I went out to the site and I started watching the birds just kind of flitting about from tree to tree. 
And what I realized was that they were using the branches of the trees as their own perches. But there was no place for a human to perch up in and around the, 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 the birds. So that concept, the idea of making a human perch, uh, became absolutely essential. Uh, that became the fundamental concept of the design of the house. Um, sketching is always a big piece of, of the puzzle, trying to figure out, okay, if you're going to make a perch for a human, how do you do it? How does that become part of a living room or a dining room or a bedroom, right? And we sketch and we sketch. We come up with different ideas. Uh, this idea for a little wiggly handrail with a little, if you look in the upper left there, you see a little platform to hold a coffee mug. So when you're locking your door or unlocking your door, you're not spilling your coffee all over yourself. Um, you're seeing here ideas of, of floor structure. You're seeing ideas integrating the plumbing into the floor structure. And then you're seeing what turned out to be one of the earliest sketches or the first sketches uh, of the idea of a perch. This cantilevered balcony up off the front of the house, which is the space where all those trees are, turns into more developed sketches. I love pencil. I love working with pencils. Um, that that turns into a building section and that building section then starts talking about airflow and how do you get air to flow through the space? How do you get air to move? Uh, we actually sat there with uh, a lit cigarette to see how the air would move before the windows were installed. And that told us where to put the operable windows, right? We couldn't afford to have every window operable. So we had to pick and choose. Um, in the end, you see the building here, you see the perch cantilevering off the front. Uh, that's off the master bedroom, master sitting area. Um, you see the, the roof rafters in the upper middle draw, uh, photograph. You see the roof rafters exposed. Um, that's an allusion to the branches of the trees up above. Um, down in the lower corner, the lower right of this slide, you see different ceilings above the walking area and above the living area. Uh, again, this is all about finding ways to draw connections between the environment um, and make a story out of the different pieces and parts of the building. Um, in the upper middle photograph, you'll also notice that the library uh, is on the second floor. We exposed the back of the books. We took the back off the library shelves so that you would see from the living space that that's actually books. You'll know that it's a library, but you're not seeing the, the spines of the books. You're seeing the pages of the books. Keep in mind, we did introduce a little detail uh, on the shelves to stop the books. So when you push them into the shelf, you don't push it out into the, you know, the space below. I mean, there's, there's details that you have to work through. There's details that come about because you're changing the game. You're changing the story. Um, in this case that, uh, bookshelves would tell. As, as part of my practice, we love to work with models. Uh, you're seeing here a model, uh, on the left, and then you're seeing the finished building uh, on the right. Um, some changes, uh, not too many, thankfully. But, you know, the, the interesting part is that the model helps you understand what it is you're trying to do. It helps you to see that finished product um, again before it's built. Uh, this house has, has gotten us a lot of attention. Um, it's been on... Um, uh, HGTV. It's won a number of awards in different states. And uh, I really do believe that quote down in the lower left there, that architecture is not necessarily about beauty. It's about the life uh, that happens in and around it. Um, a lot of fun, great clients, very adventurous people uh, looking to find something that they hadn't been able to find. And uh, I think I think we uh, we we really hit a home run with this with this house. Um, uh, they they loved it from day one. 
Another one of our projects, this was done in, in conjunction with another architectural firm, uh, was an addition to the hotel school uh, for administration up at Cornell University. Um, again, this is a hotel school. This is about hospitality. This is about openness. This is about welcoming. That's the story that this building is telling. And this big glass atrium space right on the corner uh, of the building connected people inside with the people outside and vice versa. It created this very open air uh, space in order for people uh, to feel comfortable uh, going in. Um, as you went down the walkway uh, towards the main entrance, and you can see that big glass wall to the left here, uh, you'll notice that the, the, the wall or the benches to the right uh, are not just benches, but they're actually part of a retaining wall. Uh, to hold the sidewalk and the roadway. And we could have just put a retaining wall there and called it quits, but designing that retaining wall in such a way that it actually could, becomes part of the living space of this entry plaza um, was really a wonderful challenge, and it really came out quite beautifully. Um, this place is used for parties, it's used for gatherings, and even simple details like recessing lights near the door to just to announce the fact that you're entering into the building. All of those little details really make a huge difference when it comes to telling the story uh, of the building and the building telling the story um, of what it's all about. Here you're seeing a couple of photographs of interiors. Um, a sitting area uh, to the left there under a big skylight. That's in the upper corner of that big atrium space. Very cool place to be, very cool place to hang out. It's got some great views of the campus. And then to the right there, you're just seeing a photograph of a hallway. Well, the hallway then becomes lively because of the skylights up above, because of the view out the end uh, into the trees. All those little details make make huge, huge difference. These are places for students. These are places for people to interact, right? Hospitality. This is all about interacting. It's all about um, meeting and greeting people. You have small conference spaces in the lower left there. Um, again, the hallways are generous for people to interact. On the lower right, you're seeing a photo of the stairs. Uh, with a little play, a playful column uh, to support the structure. Um, you know, it was a blast. Those are the kinds of little events that people key in on and remember um, as they're talking about the buildings. Um, this is a night view. Uh, again, you're looking straight down at the lower right. You're looking straight down towards the entrance door. Uh, and that retaining wall with all the benches is there on the right. And then you're just seeing that glow from inside of that glass atrium space. Um, that provides this feeling, this sense of, of welcoming and openness. The next project I'd like to talk about, uh, I refer to as the Sun House. Um, it was a house... Uh, where we implemented a series of both passive and active solar strategies to heat and cool the building. Uh, the passive strategies were sun angles facing the building south, overhangs to shade, and uh, the active strategy was a photovoltaic array uh, on the roof of the garage. Now, this is uh, an entrance as you're entering the property. Uh, this is one of the primary views of the building. Um, you're seeing uh, off the balcony, you're seeing a series of six solar panels. Those are functional solar panels. They're operating, providing power to the building. And you can see the overhang uh, of the roof uh, actually shades the light to keep it from coming into the space during the warmer months. Uh, that combination of active and passive solar strategies actually led to a house that produces more power than it consumes. Uh, the owner, Ron, the husband, <laughs> told me that um, when the winter comes along and we're in single-digit temperatures, um, the heat coming from the sun angle, the sun shining into that living space, uh, that space is so warm they don't even have to use the heater 
uh, to keep that space at a comfortable temperature. I call that success. I call that wisdom. I call that the way that everything should be done. Um, you use your smarts. You design the building uh, to capture what's around it for free. Um, and then you're not racking up a large energy bill, et cetera. Uh, this is a different view of the house from a little further up the hill on the garage to the left there. You can see the solar panels just barely. Um, it really, it really was cut quite an exciting, uh, a project to, to work on, to design, to build, um, because they, the owners, again, they were looking for something that they hadn't been able to find. Even on the interior, um, we exposed the frame, the structural frame of the building. Uh, and in this case, we just used standard lumber and then stained it black. And the black stain hides many of the flaws, but it looks beautiful in the space. It really, it makes the space exciting. It really captures um, the idea and it tells the story uh, of what this building is made out of what it really holds, right? The frame, what the frame really supports. Uh, and, and you can see here, even little details uh, in the lower right, um, a bar type railing uh, in order to hold and store uh, the wife's, um, Cheryl's um, saddle. Uh, becomes a feature piece as you enter into the building, you enter into the space, it's a blast. And again, um, we used um, shade devices. You can see them in the upper windows in this photograph. Those go all the way down to the floor. So in the event that they're feeling a little too hot, uh, they can roll those shades all the way down to the floor and, uh, and completely block out the sun. It's, um, it's something that the owners have control over, which is the really cool part in my, in my opinion. Uh, the next house, I refer to it as the understory house. This, this one is one of my favorites for many reasons. Um, the husband and wife are very tall people, uh, six foot six, and I'm only six foot even. So, uh, they're, they're a full head above me, which was kind of fun. But the wife said that when I first met them, she said, I'm just tired of feeling too big for all of my spaces. I'm just tired of feeling too big for all of my spaces. I, I, that, that was, it was simultaneously fascinating and sad. And I said, well, you know what? Let's see if we can fix that in the new house. So as we designed, I started to work with her proportion to, to lay out the spaces. Her height became, became the starting point for the spaces. And I, I disregarded all the conventions uh, of building house and bearing heights and, and stud heights and all of that. And I just said, let's start with her height and work from there. Well, as, as it turned out, um, there's this three-story atrium space right in the center of the house. And all of the spaces wrap around uh, that atrium space. As we were getting close to the end of construction, I was milling about doing my inspection work and she was standing in this space right about where I am standing in this photo, uh, uh, taking this photograph. And she was looking up towards the skylights and I kept milling about doing my work and she kept staring up and I kept milling about and she kept staring up. Well, anyway, <laughs> I walked over to her and I said, so, do you feel short? And she looked at me and she said, yeah, yeah, I do. And I said, it feels kind of weird, doesn't it? <laughs> and we, we both had this incredible laugh, but you know, the, the, the great part is that it allowed her to experience something that she hadn't been able to experience before. Even the little details you see at that little third story balcony jutting out into the space, there's two vertical slits those are the places where their son, Aiden, told me he wanted to be able to hide so he could squirt his mother with his water pistol and be protected. Um, those kinds of little details really make it their house, not just somebody's house. Uh, this is a, a photo in the same space 
looking over at the stairs and you'll notice the angle tops to the windows uh, are not just to be decorative or to look cool, but when you're walking up the stairs and your eyes are six feet, three inches, right? Her head is six feet, six, her eyes are three inches lower. She's able to, as she's walking up the stairs, she's able to look out and up into the trees because of the way the windows are angled. That was a very intentional, a very conscious thought, uh, again, to make this building more about her and tell her story uh, than about anyone. Um, we, we, with their encouragement, we played with the details. Uh, you're looking back into the space here. You're seeing the skylights that are buffered by the, the roof structure, right? The rafters cut across the skylights. And what that does is reflect the light off of the color of the wood back into the space to help warm up the space. Uh, here's a photograph looking into the main living space, the kitchen off to the left, the dining room in the middle under that central light fixture, and then the living space off over near the fireplace. And notice some of the details, especially the one here to support the beam. Uh, on the left here, you're just seeing wood corbelled out, um, picking up on a detail that was very common in the Maya times. Um, it was very common in brick construction and here in wood construction to support a beam. And then I'm going to say one of my favorite photos of the house, this one on the right, uh, where the husband, his, all, his name is also Ed, uh, and the dog Marley uh, have pushed the wall, the glass wall out of the way, right? It's a collapsible glass wall and it just opens up the whole room. Uh, to that back space, that backyard, and they're just standing there enjoying it. Uh, again, one of my favorite photos. This is even right before they moved in. You can see the dog beds in the in the lower left of this photograph. You can see my drawings sitting on the kitchen counter. Um, but again, just that 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 clients could enjoy their house so much. Um, in in this particular case, they actually opened their house up. Uh, for a fundraiser uh, for the Southern Chester County um, United Way. And uh, this is a photograph at night. You're seeing some of the decorative lights. You're seeing some of the spotlighting. Uh, and just people on the balcony uh, outside or on the terrace outside uh, enjoying themselves. And, you know, this again, this becomes the story of the family who lives there. It becomes that exciting piece of the puzzle. And uh, this, is, this is why I continue to enjoy being an architect. Um, I never would have hoped that it could, it could be brought this far, and I'm hoping that uh, in the next few years that I can push it even further uh, to find new ways to tell stories about people and, and, and places and, and, uh, and just keep experimenting. And finding adventurous people is one of the keys to that puzzle. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to create this, uh, to create this presentation. Uh, my name is Ed Rami. My company name is Ed Rami Architect, and you can see my website, www.edrami.com. And, uh, you can see quite a few more of my projects on my website and, uh, I'll stop here. And I wish we were in person together so I could take questions and we could have discussions. Uh, but um, we'll leave it here. And uh, thank you very much.